Morning all. I'm, I'm expecting the second session to be better populated than the first session because I could certainly hear the party going on at 1am outside my window last night. So good of you to make it to the, to the early session. Uh, this topic was a request, I think it was from uh, the uh, regional panels in uh, Darling Downs looking at sulphur, potential for sulphur deficiency due to the rather extensive flooding that has been occurring in South East Queensland and, and what does that mean for sulphur responses. What are the take home messages? Uh, my understanding is, and that might be the first question Bede asks when the session's finished, is how widespread sulphur deficiency really is. I'm not convinced that it is widespread yet. Um, I am convinced that it will eventually be widespread, but many of you might not be practising as agronomists by that time. Or we don't actually know when it will be uh, entirely diabolical. The, the shift to zero tillage systems uh, and residue management is part of the reason that issues with sulphur deficiency have, have slowed down. Uh, we'll talk about in the 80s and 90s how they were increasing in prevalence, but the change in, in farming system has done a fair bit towards resolving sulphur deficiency potential. Uh, and one of the take home messages is the soil testing strategies probably need a bit of re refinement. Uh, zero to 10 in the surface uh, probably isn't as useful an indicator for identifying sulphur responsiveness and some deeper soil tests might be advisable. But we'll cover that in due course. When I talk to the second year students at UNE, uh, I put this slide up of the standard sulphur cycle. Uh, plants take up sulphur in the form of sulphate, so this is a bit of a going back to school class on the sulphur cycle just to get a feel for why deficiencies may or may not be showing up. Uh, soil solution sulphate there, the great big uh, circle in the middle there, is the main, the main form that plants access. So anything that contributes into that pool is going to be seen by the plant and taken up by the plant. The, in, prepara in preparing this uh, talk, I realised there's actually a couple of things missing that are quite important for vertisols. The sulphur cycle, this is, this is from a textbook uh, written in 1996 by some Kiwi fellows because there's no decent Australian soil science textbooks out there as far as I'm aware. Um, and there's two bits missing for vertisols. One is an arrow that leads from crop residues through to soil organic sulphur. Uh, you can see that it comes out of the back end of that uh, beautiful uh, sheep there into soil organic sulphur, but one of the main pathways, particularly in zero-till systems, is movement of sulphur from crop residues back into that soil organic sulphur pool. Uh, the biocycling of sulphur. So in a flooded environment where the sulphur may have moved deeper down the profile and you might get a transient temporary sulphur deficiency showing up until the roots catch up with that sulphur front, and then access that sulphur, take it up into their biomass, and then the leaves drop off and die, drop that sulphur back on the surface. Uh, this, this pathway, I think, is a, is a big missing arrow for vertisol sulphur cycling. The second one is gypsum. Uh, I was quite surprised that gypsum wasn't actually in that sulphur cycle. Uh, gypsum precipitates out of solution when calcium concentrations and sulphur concentrations get a little bit too hot, you'll have the formation of gypsum. And what I think happens with uh, vertisols is that the way the concentration of calcium and sulphur in that soil water, in that soil solution, is what determines when gypsum drops out. So if you are completely flooded, as much of the Dowling Downs was for the last couple of years, if you're completely flooded, there's heaps of water there, and so your calcium and your sulphur are in solution, and the sulphur is free to move, free to leach, free to drift down that soil profile. But as it drains and as it dries out, then the amount of water relative to the calcium and the sulphur in that soil water 
changes. So as the profile dries, gypsum will slowly precipitate out of that. And then when you wet it back up again, it has to dissolve back into that. So this is the main reason why sulphate does not leach as rapidly as something like nitrate. Because nitrate doesn't have very many cations that it just says, hey, I'm just going to hang out with you when the going gets a bit dry. Gypsum drops out reasonably early, and so you've got this lag effect on keeping gypsum reasonably high up in the profile, slowing the leaching of sulphate through that process, through that mechanism. So in vertisols, that's quite important. What does sulphur deficiency look like? What are you looking for? Uh, I'm glad that that image shows up better there. It's very pale on my screen. And that's the key thing that you're looking for is paleness in the upper canopy. So the key thing to distinguish sulphur deficiency from nitrogen deficiency is that the upper leaves will be pale rather than the lower leaves. So you'll s it's very easy to confuse sulphur deficiency and nitrogen deficiency. Very, very easy. <laughs> but when you go and have a look at the individual plants, you'll see that the, the yellowness will sit in the upper part of those leaves. The older leaves will stay slightly greener for a sulphur deficient plant. So when you go in a bit closer, you'll see there that the older leaf there is still, yellow, is still reasonably green, but the younger leaf is less green. Uh, I had the pleasure of looking through the update notes last night and saw that there's been a whole heap of information on canola in the north and sulphur responses, or the lack thereof, in uh, canola in the north. Uh, that doesn't surprise me. I, I wouldn't expect major sulphur issues at the moment. Uh, and major sulphur responses. But that's what can show up in canola when you do run out of S. You will have uh, patches in the paddock. That patch there, the slightly greener patch that hasn't flowered as prolifically, is actually a sandier part of the paddock. So when the EM goes over, it reads lower in the sandier part, and sandier textured soils allow that sulphur to leach more freely and so that part of the paddock had sulphur deficiency, whereas the finer textured, more clay content parts of the paddock did not have sulphur deficiency showing up. So in that flooded scenario that prompted the question, what has happened is I believe that that beautiful white layer, and if anyone does have images of gypsum bands on record anywhere, feel free to send them to me. I did email around a whole heap of researchers to ask for a picture of a gypsum band uh, and came up with nothing. So I don't even know if that's gypsum. That could be lime. <laughs> it's far more likely to be lime. But it demonstrates the purpose that you will have layers of gypsum crystals at depth. Now where that shows up varies with rainfall uh, quite strongly and the depth at which it shows up varies with rainfall. But if you've had a flooding event and you've moved that sulphur down the profile just a little way further, eventually the roots will catch up with that and the plant will grow out of its sulphur deficiency and invert that profile and start in two or three years time, you probably will find the sulphur response that you've seen early vanishing because you've moved that sulphur that's escaped a bit up onto the surface. Five minutes, golly, you said you were going to tap at ten. Oh, okay. So why, why is uh, sulphur rundown uh, happening? In the 80s and 90s, there were more sulphur responses showing up. Uh, there was a fair bit of uh, stubble burning going on back then, and that's a major form of sulphur loss from a farming system. But with the change in farming system to zero till and producers not burning off all of their residue, you tend to start cycling that sulphur through the residue more successfully, uh, but input was lower than output, and so sulphur was slowly running down. Where is most of the sulphur coming from? It's coming from that organic pool. So the mineralisation of organic carbon to release that sulphur is where it's coming from. We don't know where that cliff is. At the moment, 
we're just trickling out enough sulphur, I believe, each year to sustain productivity with the absence of higher, higher sulphur concentration fertilisers. But I think that eventually that labile organic matter, that reserve of sulphur that we're slowly burning down despite the government's plan to uh, turn around carbon and get carbon going back up again, um, will eventually hit a cliff. We don't know where that cliff is. We don't know where that cliff is. And if there was a research question that needed to be addressed, I suspect one of them is, when does that labile organic fraction run out? When do we hit the wall? with labile organic sulphur. Eventually we will run into sulphur deficiency. The reason that we're not um, running into sulphur deficiency more frequently, uh, I think, is because of the farming systems that have been adopted. That's me done, is it? No. Oh, OK. So inputs are quite low, generally, uh, in the in the Northern Grange region, so at the coast you can have 20 kilos of sulphur fall from the sky, courtesy of the ocean, but uh, over most of the Grange region you're only getting one to two kilos input in rain. And obviously as you go further west you get less sulphur. Until it spikes again, just a little bit out at Burke because it's covered in gypsum and the dust blows up into the sky and then falls back down as rain. Jim Laycock gave me uh, access to this data that he presented to Northern Panel uh, a few months ago as to what the sulphur status was in northern regions. Uh, this was quite informative. KCL40, which is a dilute salt extraction that pulls a bit of that organic fraction into solution so that you can measure how much is there. And you can see that uh, a fair proportion of that is lower than eight milligrams. You might ask, what's the critical value? Well, for almost every species of economic significance in the northern grain region, we don't know, uh, except for winter cereals, probably about three milligrams per kilogram is the number where you might see a sulphur response. So if more than half of it is less than eight, it's not a dire situation yet. Because if you look at the soil depth that that's sampled over, that's um, the top 60 centimetres, and up in the top 10 centimetres, which is where the test is calibrated, then you're more than likely gonna have three milligrams per kilogram of sulphur floating around up there. Unless you're in central Queensland, in which case those profiles are pretty low in sulphur all the way down. The same story shows up for um, monocalcium phosphate extractable sulphur. The numbers are usually higher because it's a, it's a more concentrated salt and so you get more of that adsorbed sulphur. Uh, both of these tests actually do pull some gypsum out. I did have some queries about that uh, through the week because these must have gone online early or something, online early publication of GRDC update. I don't know what John thinks about that, but um, it does pull out gypsum. What are the critical S values? Um, we don't know for most of the species. That was reasonably clear in the canola papers that have been presented here this week. We don't know what the critical values are. Uh, three milligrams per kilogram for cereals. That's about all we've got. Uh, as canola increases in the north, we're going to want to quantify that. When are we going to see responses to sulphur? What are the sampling depths that are going to give us the most information about when we see a sulphur response? Uh, we don't know that either, but there is a proposal to GRDC to investigate that and hopefully over the next few years we'll be able to answer some of those questions. And we don't know where that cliff is. When do we run out of labile organic sulphur? Uh, the reason I'm saying labile is that there's always going to be carbon in your profiles um, because there's been a lot of burning. There's going to be a lot of charcoal there. Charcoal is not available sulphur. <laughs> it never will be. So we're talking about that proportion of the organic carbon in your soils that actually can contribute sulphate to your crop. Current sulphur research, there's uh, increasing interest in sulphur research. One of the more recent things is DGT soil sulphur. Um, Chris is going to jump up at the end and give you a heads up on DGT soil phosphorus. Um, so I'm not going to steal any of his thunder on my thoughts on DGTP. Um, but DGTS, I was involved in some of the early work on DGTS and those are the results. 
uh, how does that DGT test correlate with uh, sulphur uptake and relative yield. And you can see from that you would say, hey, that is way better than our existing tests. Uh, of course, the caveat on that is that this was a five-week pot trial, and pot trials over five weeks are pretty much measuring sulphate. And DGTS will give you a very good picture of sulphate, but a crop will use that sulphate up and rely on adsorbed sulphur or organic sulphur to actually grow all the way through to yield. So in terms of does DGT actually stack up as a way of accessing either adsorbed or organic sulphur, uh, the jury is still out, but there is funding uh, available down in Adelaide to investigate and answer that question. Um, I'm not so convinced that it will, but then, yeah. So, take home message again. I don't think self-deficiency is widespread, but I would be very keen to see the hands of people who have observed self-deficiency and how long it lasted for and whether it affected yield. Um, I'd be definitely interested in that. Uh, residue management, so there's been a bit of information, I think, at this update about strategic tillage to try and overcome nutrient stratification uh, and a bit of murmuring maybe that maybe that's not the... Do we really want to... We've just spent all of our time convincing people not to till. <laughs> do we want to turn that around in some way? I, I think there probably is a place, even from sulphur perspectives, to engage in a bit of strategic tillage. Uh, and we still don't know about which depths to target uh, to capture that subsoil sulphur front, to know where that is sitting. Uh, I've put some suggestions in the paper, and you can have a look at that later, but I think there probably does need to be a bit more research into where to do that. Uh, Chris and Dave Lester did some stuff at Colonse about which depths back in 2001, and the results are in the paper there, uh, but it wasn't that conclusive per se. There wasn't that much difference between them. Um, can we use grain sulphur? Uh, the Colonse data says no for sorghum. Uh, maybe, well, I'm not convinced that you can use it for cereals yet either, but certainly the sulphur values are falling in cereals, but the yields don't seem to be. So I'm not convinced that we can actually use grain as a surrogate for incipient creeping up sulphur deficiency. So there's a bit of research out there that needs to be done, but I think the main reason we're not seeing sulphur deficiency showing up extensively at the moment is that we're running out of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium first. So there's probably a bit of work to do there earlier. I'm all done. Questions? Bede. Oh, all right. Uh, anyone who's got a question just might like raise their hand and I'll do my best to get around. Uh, is there anyone in the front row? The audience has doubled during this talk. That's, that's quite amazing. When is uh, residue management important? Are yeah, there different uh, residue management systems that will be better than others? Uh, I don't think the research has been done on that, but basically keeping as much of your stubble in the system as possible uh, for as long as possible will increase the return of sulphur into that system. I think some strategic incorporation might aid that, but I don't think the, well, I don't think the research has actually been done to work out which is the best one. I know that burning is a bad one. Uh, a lot of sulphur goes off when you burn. Um, so the, the, the ceasing of burning uh, was definitely of value. But in answer to your question, I don't think that I could nominate a residue management system that is better than any other residue management system other than to maximise the residue return. Uh, should you graze it and turn it into poo before you... It's going to change your distribution across your paddock, yes, but I think the sulphur is going to come out of that residue and cycle back in. Well, I'm specifically wondering whether there's a difference between leaving stubble standing or 
<laughs> um, yes, that's a very important question, and it's uh, there's actually some ex UNE students in the audience that I regularly ask this question: What should you do? Should you leave it standing, or should you knock it down? It depends on, to a certain extent, what your aim is. Um, if you knock it down, it breaks down faster, and then you might then lose the cover that you're trying to keep to minimise erosion from occurring off your paddock. And in my view, soil loss is the much higher risk to seek to avoid. So whichever system you choose to do to manage your stubble, you want to have cover for late February storms, really. So you knock it over, it'll break down faster and it'll release faster. But if you then lost half a centimetre of topsoil off your paddock because you didn't have cover, you've lost more sulphur in that event than you might have ever saved by pushing it over and incorporating it a bit early. So, but I think there needs... I'm very tempted to go out to some places and just do that trial, just to test. But soil protection, I think, is the key. Question down here. I was just wondering if you've done any work with uh, manures, because uh, I haven't done a game with you, it's a lot of manure now. Um, I think there's definitely sulphur in it. <laughs> I, I agree, there's definitely sulphur in manure. I mean, again, you have the, yeah, a lot of my area, it's either uh, feed up manure, poultry, more feed. Yep. It's very widespread over the dam, so yep. if, if we must be bolstering sulfur there. There is sulfur there. Um, there's lots of other things there as well. Uh, so if you can get access to manure, fantastic. Uh, there's a couple of rules that have probably been presented at updates in the past on how to work out how much manure to apply. I wouldn't be applying manure at a sulfur rate. Um, to meet sulphur requirements, per se. Um, the, and I wouldn't be using it to, uh, as a nitrogen rate either, because what you end up with is a massive oversupply of phosphorus and, and other things. And, and one of the things to watch with manures is if they've come out of feedlots and they try and make those cattle thirsty with a bit of sodium, uh, you probably want to keep an eye on the sodium concentration of the manure as well. But manure is a fantastic source. Yeah, if you've got close access to it, basically it comes down to transport costs and you're carrying a lot of water around with that poo, so. Are there any other questions? Oh no, now I'm in trouble. From your, from your research, the only other tool we've got to consult in short term to make a decision is competition. Do you have a lot of that? As reliable as the person who's taking the tissue sample, is that? The right answer. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, tissue sampling is, I think it's a reasonably good indicator of sulphur deficiency. As you can see from the images, it goes yellow, it's low sulphur, it, it's reasonably clear. But uh, the timing of that collection, the leaf that you take it from, and uh, how quickly you get it to the lab, all affect the reliability of the number that's generated. So. Uh, if you're not trained in tissue sampling techniques, then I would probably still err towards soil. I think there's more... Oh, dear, it's a tough one. There's, <laughs> there's just as much error sampling soil as there is sampling tissue, but um, it is a reliable indicator, I think, of sulphur deficiency, absolutely. Any other questions at this point? Just a comment is that uh, one thing that can be important in the appearance of uh, sulfur deficiency is the length of dye uh, coming up to the crop, and that um, because sulfur is coming from the mineralisation of the organic matter pool, the timing of that dye can have an influence on the following crop. Yep. I've seen this in uh, Bali on the eastern dam. 
been yeah. realised yet. Yeah, yeah. So a bit of time for that residue to break down, and yeah, that that's a very intelligent comment. So it's not necessarily a question. <laughs> Look, uh, I'm sorry to say that we're out of time, but just before we do move on, um, Chris asked for a show of hands on, um, yeah. from the audience. Um, you just repeat your question, Chris, and we might... Well, how, how many of you actually saw salt deficiency this, in, in, in the last season's crop? Yeah, one... In the last season? No? Oh, ever. OK. Just, just recently, after the floods, how many of you actually saw salt deficiency? So, one. Two. Three. Three. And how many of you have seen sulphur deficiency over your careers? A long time ago or in the very recent past? Everyone's looking down. No comments? Okay. Uh, all right, look, uh, we might move on, but um, put your door with me and taking Chris Cuppy for the audience.